This is a chart showing the defense spending of America and the next nine countries combined. We all know the US spends a staggering amount on its military, but it's easy to justify the cost when national integrity and safety are involved. Things get tricky, however, when you look at who decides when the United States intervenes with military force and what they stand to gain from such defense efforts. On August the 31st, 2021, the United States formally ended their involvement in the Afghanistan war. After 20 years of US-sanctioned counter-terrorism operations, hundreds of thousands of deaths, and trillions of dollars in debt, the messy and controversial withdrawal closed the chapter to the longest war intervention in US history. Six months later, on February 24, 2022, Putin invaded Ukraine, kicking off the Russia-Ukraine war. As a show of support and solidarity, the United States joined other NATO allies in assisting Ukraine, a potential NATO member, with military supplies and aid. Looking at it from the surface, it seems like the two situations have nothing to do with one another. In reality, the stakes are more complicated, and interestingly, more profitable than they appear. Though both wars took place thousands of miles from each other and featured different conflict drivers, they share one strange and compromising similarity. They're linked to the direct financial involvement and investment from United States members of Congress. Elected officials from the governing body that decides when to go to war, who to support in an overseas conflict, and how much military aid to provide, have monetary and political rewards to gain from any war in question. Seriously, it's not some conspiracy theory either. It's crazy to think that despite being given the power to declare war since 1789 when Congress was originally established, they have only used that power 11 times, with the last being against Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania back in 1942. If you're thinking that the United States has been at war with Vietnam, North Korea, Iran, or Afghanistan since then, you're wrong. Throwing out formal declarations, Congress now exercises military power via the modern Authorization for the Use of Military Force, or AUMF. With this, the United States avoids the diplomatic nightmare of actively and formally declaring another nation as the enemy, while growing its defense and influence. It also makes it easier for the United States to negotiate with a nation they're taking military action against. The AUMF has become a Congress favorite, and the United States has used its armed forces abroad around 243 times since 1942. While the necessity of these interventions can be debated all day, the conflict of interest that arises when you combine them with Congress members' investments is pretty damning. It has all to do with the close relationships leaders from both the Democratic and Republican parties have with defense companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies, and Honeywell, and how they use them. These are companies the average person knows little to nothing about, because they don't sell the average goods and services. These guys are world-famous weapons constructors and defense tech developers. Take for instance Lockheed Martin. They provide state-of-the-art high-tech integrated air and missile defense systems, satellites, and many other weapons. They're one of the top three missile defense companies in the world, but they're also heavily involved in Capitol Hill, spending millions of dollars lobbying the government and bidding on major government contracts. This is one of the biggest problems facing the United States today, and I don't think some people understand just how massively lobbying influences everything. This is a table showing the monetary amount contributed to the House and Senate Armed Service Committees so far this election cycle. It's over 10 million in total. If we break it down in terms of the House Committee, for example, this graph shows the top 20 recipients from the defense sector, and you'll notice that of these 20 recipients, 12 of them serve in leadership roles on the Armed Services Committee. And who are they funded by? Well, you can see that there's the obvious mainstays that we talked about, but also General Dynamic, the fifth largest defense contractor in the world by arms sales, and L3 Harris Technologies, which provides tons of advanced defense systems, among a few other companies as well. This isn't even all the money Congress gets from the defense sector either. There's even more to be made, because these companies hold some of the Congress's largest stock investments. Think about this. From the time Congress approved the invasion of Afghanistan back in 2001, stocks for the top five defense companies in the world rose in value by an insane average of 900%, with the total cost of post 9-11 wars and other operations having surpassed $8 trillion. Guess who made tons of money from that? Out of the many buying into the profitability of war are 51 known Congress members and their spouses. 
Honeywell holds the largest investment in defense industry stocks from House Representatives. A 2020 report discovered that Honeywell raked in over $5.8 billion from the Pentagon as well as foreign defense customers like Tommy Tuberville, a Republican U.S. Senator who sits on the Armed Services Committee while having $130,000 worth of stocks in Honeywell, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and General Dynamics. Sheldon Whitehouse, a U.S. Democratic Senator, has a similar portfolio, holding $500,000 worth of stocks in Lockheed, Raytheon, and Honeywell, while serving on the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. At least 11 U.S. Senators hold up to $1.7 million in defense industry stocks, and at least 36 U.S. Representatives hold a maximum value of over $5 million. Republican U.S. Representative Kevin Hearn, who owns up to $880,000 in Honeywell stocks, has investments in Boeing and Raytheon that total $110,000, as well as some in Lockheed worth up to $30,000. This makes him one of the biggest congressional investors in defense companies and contractors. All of this while chairing the Republican Study Committee's Budget and Spending Task Force, a committee that put forward a budget template that would immediately increase the national security budget by instituting a 3% real growth boost. That's a $22 billion increase that could potentially benefit the companies Kevin Hearn has stocks in. And it's all legal, because, you know, the United States is essentially a free market and all. So while it's morally questionable and disappointing, what these representatives are doing doesn't break the law. Things get worse, however, when you consider the timing of such investments. Some of these representatives have had long-term shares that blossomed during the post-9-11 wars. Others made rapid stock purchases just weeks before Putin invaded Ukraine. Weapons like the Javelin and Stinger missiles made by both Raytheon and Lockheed are coincidentally the same weapons being deployed to Ukraine from Western allies. In response to this, politicians like Republican Rep John Rutherford invested anywhere from $1,000 to $15,000 on the same day Russia invaded. Some, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, invested two days before. As far back as January, when it was revealed that the United States had allowed Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania to send Javelin and Stinger missiles to Ukraine forces, House representatives started trading defense company stocks. Republican Rep Diana Harshbarger and her spouse made a series of trades worth up to $15,000, and Democratic Rep Lois Frankel sold around the same Lockheed Martin stocks while keeping shares in the defense company. That's also another problem. Congress doesn't ever have to disclose the specific dollar amount, they can put it in broad ranges such such as $1,000 to $15,000, or $250 to $500,000, making it even more secretive in how much they're profiting. But it's not just defense firms that these politicians are investing in. House Republican Andrew Garbarino disclosed the purchase of stock from Tellurian Incorporated, which is a natural gas company in Texas, that saw a 29% increase in stocks after the Russian invasion. He also sits on the House Committee on Homeland Security and its Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation Subcommittee, among many others. With major sanctions against Russia cutting off major gas supplies in Europe, companies like Tellurian will see long-term benefits from increased purchases of their products. These are just some of the 100 defense companies that have facilitated the purchasing of anywhere from $2.5 to $5.8 million worth of stocks for the 51 Congress members. The practices mimic insider trading, which allows investors to use privileged knowledge not made public to buy or sell stocks. That's something which, by the way, Congress members have gotten caught up in as well. To try and confront this incredible conflict of interest, the 2012 Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, or STOC, was introduced. This act attempts to straighten out Congress investment moves and prohibits, I quote, members of Congress and employees of Congress from using non-public information derived from their official positions for personal benefits and for other purposes. It also demands that Congress members disclose their financial investment transactions within 45 days after a trade. Now, while this act seems like a step forward in the right direction, it doesn't seem to be working out that well given what's been happening. Proving insider trading on this level is one of the hardest things because it mostly relies on confession from those who witnessed the activities. On top of that, the punishment for failing to disclose these investments is basically pennies compared to what these Congress people are making. A first time late fee of just $200 is charged if you fail to disclose your investments on time. And there's no public records that even confirm if these fees are ever collected or how multiple offenders are fined, if they even are. Because the Act allows Senate and House ethics officials to waive the fee if you give a sufficient reason, whatever that may mean, not that it really matters anyway. Look at Deb Fisher, a Republican senator from Nebraska, for example. She's on the Senate Ethics Committee, yet some of her top campaign contributors are again Lockheed Martin, 
Raytheon Technologies, Honeywell, and we can even add in General Dynamics again. Basically, you just get a pass. In case you're wondering if things get worse, they do. Not only do Congress members directly invest in the defense companies they know will be used should the US intervene in an ongoing conflict, but they vote to keep the defense budgets high enough to pay out these companies, and as an extension, themselves. Some of these Congress members directly vote on how the yearly budget will be used, as well as how these defense contractors operate within the country. Looking at all of the Lockheed Martin locations across the United States, places like Maryland, which hosts the headquarters, Colorado, Texas, and Washington DC directly benefit from the job creation of these facilities. That makes it harder for senators and representatives to cut portions of the defense budgets that go towards manufacturing goods in these facilities. Take for example the 2012 Pentagon proposal to save $3 billion by halting production of the M1 Abrams tanks. Fearful that the move would slash 800 jobs in Ohio, Congress instead allocated $250 million towards keeping the manufacturing plant open and constituents happy. The trend persisted in 2015 when Army Chief of Staff General Raymond Odierno revealed to Congress that the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on tanks were being wasted as some were obsolete. Despite these types of events happening, the defense budget barely decreases and is expected to jump to over $800 billion in 2023. So what can be done? Well, 76 percent of voters believe that lawmakers and their spouses have an unfair advantage in the stock market, making this a rare instance where supporters on opposite sides of an increasingly politically divided country find themselves agreeing with each other. Americans must jointly and loudly voice their concerns for this, as well as petitioning and demanding more from their elected officials. It's a complex situation, no doubt fueled by the military-industrial complex, but one thing is for certain. American politicians love war.